Hello, everybody. This is Dr. Albert Ewer. I'm a professor at Rutgers University, an adjunct faculty at the County College of Morris Respiratory Program. I co-edit three textbooks, including Egan's Fundamentals of Respiratory Care, but I'm coming to you today in a different capacity. I'm the co-owner of a and Lectures, along with Terry Shenfield. Today, I'll be presenting to you on an important topic related to the management of a difficult airway. So now, let's take a look at the learning objectives. So the objectives for today's presentation on managing a difficult airway are as follows. First and logically, I'll be covering the indications and contraindications for intubation. I'll also be giving you clues on different aspects you can look at to determine whether or not the airway itself will be difficult. So really recognizing the difficult airway in advance of establishing it. I'll then be covering special considerations for managing a difficult airway. Sometimes, you'll, again, you'll have clues that give you an idea to expect that the airway may be difficult ahead of time. Other times, it will frankly be a bit of a surprise. I will give you clues to manage both situations. In addition, we'll be covering related equipment, including laryngoscopes, with a particular focus on video laryngoscopes, the, as I like to say, the anatomy and physiology of an intubation box, so the intubation box contents, where things are typically located in the intubation boxes. We'll also be talking about sizing ET tubes, endotracheal tubes, as well as sizing laryngeal mask airways, or LMAs. We'll also be talking about the actual difficult airway box, um, if your facility actually has them. It is strongly recommended that institutions that do intubation have them strategically located throughout their facility. The a funky thing about difficult airway is, again, in some cases, you don't know it's going to be difficult until you find out it is. So it's always a good idea to have um, the, the difficult airway box in close proximity, again, if your institution has such an initiative. <clears throat> We'll then be examining key steps in the procedure. And I say procedures because the actual process of intubating, but also the important steps when you're assisting intubation. So we're well aware that not every facility allows respiratory therapists to intubate, even though in essentially all states in the United States, it is within our licensure scope of practice. Despite that, in some institutions, respiratory therapists do not intubate, but they very much assist in the process and assist in the related processes, such as setting up the ventilator, setting up monitoring equipment, and things along those lines. We'll then be focusing on confirming placement. As you can imagine, extremely important to uh, confirm proper placement if you're in doubt follow the protocol for removing the tube, deflating the cuff, removing the tube, and resuming oxygenation and ventilation through perhaps a bag valve mask. And we'll be talking again along the lines of confirming placement measures to consider if confirmation is in doubt. Probably most importantly, I'll be providing you with additional references should you wanna learn more about this topic. So our presentations are typically about 50, that's five zero minutes, just under an hour. They're typically one CEU. We do have a few that actually go more than that that are for like 1.5 CEUs. But irrespective, it's difficult to cover every nuance about a topic in just under an hour. So we provide you guys with additional references should you wanna drill down and learn more about this topic. So now let's, let's examine common indications and contraindications for intubation. The indications include hypoxemic and or 
hypercapnic respiratory failure. I say and or because in some cases, they're both happening at the same time, which you might actually see in a code blue, where you have a carbon dioxide buildup in the blood, and you have an insufficient amount of oxygen that's going you know, into the lungs, across the alveolar capillary membranes, into the arterial blood. Prohibitive breathing pattern, prolonged tachypnea. So if an individual is breathing very quickly, and it's not due to pain, it's not due to anxiety, it looks like it's actually due to some sort of a respiratory etiology or origin. That would be another indication. Still another one is the inability to protect the airway. So whether it's an individual who's seizing, so they're having a seizure, or it's an individual that has a neuromuscular uh, problem, such as you might see with um, Guillain-Barre um, or uh, muscular dystrophy, even though actually muscular dystrophy is really more muscular um, in any of those other uh, similar disorders. Severe or worsening respiratory muscle weakness. So in some cases, the inability to protect the airway comes along with, if you will, muscle weakness, respiratory muscle weakness, such as that that would affect the diaphragm and the, um, the secondary uh, respiratory muscles, such as the intercostals and the scalenes. So when that actually happens, um, as you again might see with a neuromuscular disorder, um, it may be time to, uh, to, to strongly consider intubation, and electively so. Some contraindications would be the presence of a DNI, or a do not intubate order. A laryngectomy, in fact, what we do with our laryngectomy patients, I, in addition to doing all the things that I mentioned in my introductory slide, I still work adult acute care at a major uh, trauma center in North Central New Jersey. And we, in fact, get patients that have laryngectomies. Our protocol is also to put a sign um, in a very prominent spot in the room um, that basically says, do not intubate, because the patient does not have a patency between their mouth, if you will, um, and their, their lower airway. Epiglottitis, I've mentioned epiglottitis, a condition that is much more common in young children, you know, those children that are two, three, four years old. Um, and I, I put it there because um, the, these individuals have very swollen tissue that's around the glottis, hence epiglottitis. And many times their airway opening is, you know, a third or a quarter what it is, uh, or what it would be normally. And the last thing you want to do is have a, a less experienced intubator there kind of visualizing a glottis that's much smaller than what you would expect. And perhaps causing, in doing so, causing a laryngospasm um, that could cause that, that you know, glottis to totally spaz. Now you don't have a, a, an airway opening at all, and now you have a medical emergency, a true medical emergency. Um, so best to defer to the anesthesia um, and do probably a rap, rapid uh, sequence intubation where it involves you know, sedation, um, paralyzing agents, and then a hopefully very quick intubation, you know, confirmation of placement, uh, securing the tube, and then, you know, resuming uh, ventilation and oxygenation through a ventilator. Tachypnea due to anxiety or pain. So if the tachypnea that I re referred to in the indications, sometimes it's a respiratory cause, if it's not, and it's due to pain, anxiety, something along those lines, some sort of a, a psycho psychological disorder, um, and, you know, you do a blood gas, you find out that the blood gas, maybe it's the oxygenation is, is normal, but maybe the patient's alkalotic um, and otherwise has their x-ray looks good and the other respiratory indicators look, look good. Um, good idea not necessarily to uh, intubate a patient like that. Now let's examine the related equipment that you need. Before we get into the size tubes and laryngoscopes, let's talk about what you need in the room. And some of the, 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 the newbie, the neophyte uh, intubators, um, or uh, the newbie uh, respiratory therapists who are assisting somebody else in intubating can overlook some of this stuff. So PPE is protective, you know, your protective equipment, your, it's a good idea in the, in, in the age of, um, of, of COVID and other uh, communicable diseases to have an N95 on or even a PAPR, um, some sort of a, you know, filtration uh, device. 
Uh, our protocol at our hospital is, is a minimum an N95. Um, a manual resuscitator a bag, AMBU is a manufacturer, but AMBU or other, uh, and that it's the proper, uh, proper age specific. So if it's an adult patient that you're intubating, that you have an adult um, manual resuscitator bag. Uh, oxygen flow meter or meters, because perhaps they're on a nasal cannula right now or on a non, they're on a non rebreather. You don't want to interrupt that. So you leave that on and you would connect the manual resuscitator bag valve mask um, to, the, to that uh, second flow meter. Um, suction source, so tubing and yank hour, and there's a caveat to the yank hour later in this presentation. I'll be talking a little bit about um, an alternative to a yank hour. I don't want to uh, steal my own thunder too much, but more to come on that. Uh, end tidal cable and adapter. So the, the end tidal with waveform, if you, I don't mean you personally, but if your institution and the healthcare team has access to end tidal CO2 with waveform, that's pretty much the standard of care today. It not only is extremely useful in confirming placement, but it's also uh, useful if there is a resuscitative effort going on, it can give some very important clues as to the quality of the compressions and the overall resuscitative effort. And then a theme that I'll be uh, talking about uh, numerous times in this presentation, a difficult airway box. So it's recommended per the uh, American Society of Anesthesiologist Practice Guidelines to actually have a difficult airway box. Um, and, and I'll talk about some of the contents that you'd see in a, in a difficult airway box as we get further on in this presentation. Like I said before, and I'm, I'm being a little facetious, the anatomy of an intubation box contents, so the, the basically the contents. And again, there's a little variability from location to location, organization to organization, but pretty much you want the quick access, things that you, you're pretty much gonna need more commonly in the upper portion. You want them more accessible, okay? So a lot of these intubation box look like, um, if any, if we have any fishermen in the, or fisher ladies in the, uh, the audience, they're sort of like the, along the lines of, of a, um, a tackle box. Um, you got a lower portion, <clears throat> excuse me, and an upper portion. Upper portion, age-specific, disposable laryngoscopes and handles. Um, again, they may be uh, video or they may be the, the, the traditional non-video type. Uh, multiple age-specific uh, endotracheal tubes. So I say that because um, if, you have an, if you have an adult intubation box, pretty much they tend to go down to as low as a 6.0. Um, and if you need anything less than that, because you could have somebody who's 25 years old, but their body habitus is that of, a, of an eight year old or something along those lines, then you'd be best to ensure that you have a pediatric intubation box. Um, and even in our adult units, we absolutely have at least one pediatric uh, intubation box there. A stylet for adding rigidity to the uh, endotracheal tube. Um, in our institution, we have at least two stylets because uh, let's say you're going to intubate with an 8.0, um, you may actually um, have difficulty with that. And one of the strategies you can use is to use next size down, a 7.5. So we'll have a style, we'll have, maybe we'll have a 7.5 ready to go. A 10 ml syringe, um, a uh, ET tube tamer or some sort of a securing device um, and subglottic uh, su suction stickers. So we use a lot of subglottic. It, I don't, I don't want to say it's the standard of care, but it's strongly recommended um, that they're used to reduce the chance of a ventilator associated uh, pneumonia. So subglottic um, suction tubes will have a port that's connected to a lower level suction, typically negative 25 to 30, in order to evacuate most of the secretions that will accumulate above, okay, or proximal to the actual cuff. Um, to, to minimize, I would like to say eliminate, but to minimize the chance that um, the, you know, that, that those uh, secretions are micro aspirated down, um, you know, again, uh, um, alongside the cuff, down into the lower airway and contributing to a ventilator associated pneumonia. The lower portion would be your extra stuff, pretty much. Uh, extra age specific ET tubes. Um, we, we put a, a color sensing, uh, so a colorimic uh, and tidal CO2 detector a bag with a, we have just miscellaneous uh, things such as surgery lube, um, you know, saline, nipple adapters for, you know, oxygen and things along those lines. The extra stylet, the extra 10 ml syringe um, that I alluded to earlier on, suction kits, and pretty much, you know, your yank hour, uh, things along those lines, an extra yank hour and, and, and the like. 
sizing endotracheal tubes and LMAs. So in the upper um, right hand side, in the kind of that light green, where we have listed there the different size endotracheal tubes, um, age specific, the bottom portion of that, kind of in that solid uh, green uh, section there. Um, female, the range is typically 7.0 to 8.0, and for a male, a 7.5 to 9.0. Um, and again, just something to consider um, when you're sizing them. The other thing you may want to focus on is if you do work at a facility that, um, that uses subglottic tubes, because the subglottic, if you will, tubing um, occupies you know, space in the outside of the, and the endotracheal tube, typically like an 8.0 subglottic will have a little bit of a bigger circumference and will be closer to actually an 8.5 non-subglottic. So it's a kind of a rule of thumb. It's not a, a hard and fast rule, but just be aware that it may be a, nominally more difficult to intubate. Um, if you're you know, intubating with a subglottic 8.5, it may be closer to a nine. Um, so just something to kind of keep in the back of your mind. LMA sizing is something that's not quite as well understood, but many intubation boxes will have LMAs. Um, and I would say that essentially all um, of the difficult airway bags or boxes should have them as well. And on the bottom portion there, you'll see three, fours, and fives. Um, the children and small adults would be a three, uh, you know, mid-sized adults a four, and then a large adult greater than 70 or 75 kgs would be a five. So I say a word about uh, video laryngoscopes. I'm going to say more than a word. Obviously, there's more than a word on this slide. Um, but video laryngoscopes are becoming the standard of care. Um, and there's a variety of different types that are out there. Um, UE, the two letters UE, make them. McGrath is a very popular model that's used a handheld. Um, Ambu makes them. Glidescope makes them as well. The Ambu and the Glidescopes tend to be more, uh, they have a tower that, and, and the actual scope itself is connected to the tower uh, that has a monitor on it via a cable. And I'll talk a little bit about the, the advantages and disadvantages of having that you know, cable approach. Uh, but whether irrespective of what type of video laryngoscope that you use, they are kind of becoming the standard of care. Um, you want to make sure that you check the remaining battery life. Um, if it's a McGrath, it's a disposable, um, it's a disposable battery that typically has 250 minutes. Um, if, the, for instance, a UE scope um, would have a rechargeable feature to it, um, and the a lot of the, um, the the kind that have the remote, uh, if you will, monitor that's on a tower, uh, will, will have a battery, but it'll also be plug-in as well. Um, so you want to make sure that you have adequate battery life. If it's a plug-in, that it's adequately plugged in. What we typically do, uh, I'm a checklist guy. I, at Rutgers, I teach a course in quality management, and I firmly believe in, in checklists. I use them in my personal life. I'm a little anal retentive if you don't know that about me already. Um, but my point is, so we have a, a checklist at the beginning of the shift. Once you're done with first rounds, you go around and, and you're checking various things, making sure that there's a, an Ambu bag in every room, uh, that there's two uh, oxygen flow meters in every room, but you're also checking the video laryngoscopes to make sure that the battery, um, it, we use a lot of McGrath, that, the, that it would have a minimum of 20 to 25 minutes. You know, it's not going to take you that long to intubate, but in case somebody turns it on and leaves it on before you're ready to intubate, you don't want to have five minutes left on it. You don't want to be that person who's ready to intubate and the battery just goes dead on you. You know, you, conceivably, you could use it as an old-fashioned type. The problem is when the battery goes, you now no longer have a light source either. So it's not about just using the video feature. It's much more than that. Um, if, uh, you know, the, the, the distal end of video lens becomes soiled, and whether it's just soiled with secretions or vomitus or even... Um, with Surgilube, and I learned this the hard way. I used to use much more Surgilube on the end of my endotracheal tubes. Uh, I use much less now because if the uh, end of the uh, laryngoscope, the video laryngoscope becomes smudged with, um, with Surgilube, it's going to be a blurry vision and you're just going to have to take it out. You have to wipe it down, put the blade back on, and it's, it's, it's kind of a big deal. Or you may just go to the the non-video uh, laryngoscope that's actually still in our intubation boxes and, and go the old-fashioned way. Um, and again, so it, it, whether it's surgilube or vomitus or secretions, just kind of be, be careful and just be aware. 
Um, in, in that case, I will tell you that you still have a light source. It's smudged, but it's a light source. You, you can use the laryngoscope just as the old fashioned type. It's going to function pretty much the same way. A little bit more of a curvature, but you still should be able to lift and hopefully visualize the glottis and intubate. Uh, endotracheal tube tip will not initially become visible until advanced. So initially, the, you know, you, you're, you're setting up your tube or you have a helper setting up your tube. Um, you've tested the cuff. You have the, the syringe, uh, you know, all attached there, whatever. You're advancing it, but you're looking at a little, little, little video screen or a large one if it's, again, in a remote tower. Um, but at some point, you cannot see the tip of the tube. Unlike the old-fashioned traditional way, you never lose sight. You have your direct, you know, a direct, uh, if you will, sight of the, of the glottis. With a video scope, you do not for a period of time. So you just, you know, it's like everything. You just got to practice and become proficient with, you know, with how it functions and what to expect. Um, and again, may require more of a curve to the ET tube, may result in more soft tissue injuries. So these are not the injuries that are life-threatening injuries. These are the ones that are just around the, the mucosa, perhaps around, you know, the false cords. It's not nothing. Um, but what they are finding is it's easier to intubate, but in some cases, there's a higher prevalence of soft tissue injury around the glottis. Some key steps in the procedure involve the following, confirming indications and obtain a physician's order, gather and set up the equipment. And again, I have a separate slide on, on, uh, on just equipment. Um, assess the degree of difficulty. And again, sometimes you're not going to know until you're there. Sometimes there are clues that you could look at in advance. Anatomical issues, baseline anatomy, if you will, facial, airway, neck trauma, sedation issues where it's difficult to sedate the patient, patient position, pre-oxygenate, medicate if needed, check, remove dentures. Uh, we were intubating a patient yesterday, and indeed she had some implants in the upper, but she had lower dentures. And you know she was she was uh, actually a Guillain-Barre patient, and I even asked her things like she was functional, but there was elective intubation. Her her bedside mechanics were your NIF and her vital capacity were really going down uh, uh, precipitously. But I asked her, how tall are you? She's 5'3". Uh, um, are those your teeth? You know, you don't always have that luxury, luxury, but, you know, we had the vent all set up with the, you know, 8 mLs per kg, which is, you know, she had healthy lungs, what we were starting off with. Um, so in any event, insert laryngoscope, sweep the tongue to the left. I have a separate slide on that. Lift the epiglottis to hopefully visualize the glottis. Glottis being the opening between the vocal cords. Advance the ET tube through the oral pharynx, under the epiglottis, through the glottis. Inflate the ET tube cuff, um, connect manual resuscitator, ventilate, and confirm placement via end tidal CO2, um, bilateral breath sounds, BBS, and eventually a chest x-ray. Some key points to consider when assisting another, whether it's assisting a physician or assisting your fellow respiratory therapist. Help ensure that all supplies and equipment are in the room. Again, seeing those uh, preceding slides. Help prepare the equipment, inserting the stylet, connect the syringe, test the cuff. Um, what I also do when I'm testing the cuff is I'll also pull the cuff back slightly. So I want it tapered backwards because it's an easier passage through the glottis than if you have, if you will, kind of a plunger type effect um, it's just, just, you know, I, I believe in taking every reasonable advantage that you can, and that's, that's one of them. And you have to test the cuff anyhow, so. Um, have available one size smaller ET tube, alternative laryngoscope blades, um, uh, set up the entitled cable and the adapter, uh, you know, in advance, assuming you have, you know, access to uh, capnography with waveform, um, suction slash yank hour, and again, I'll add on um, one, one addendum onto the yank hour uh, uh, concept as we go through and focus on difficult airway box content. So there's an alternative to the yank hour is my point. Help position the patient, pull them up in bed, a sniffing position, manually uh, ventilate, oxygenate, and monitor the, the saturation. Help ensure that all supplies and equipment are situated near the intubator uh, and that they're functional. Um, I had a case where uh, I had a relatively new hire who was assisting me with an intubation, and I asked him to get me a yank hour, and he did. He handed me the yank hour, but it wasn't connected to anything. <laughs> so it was, it's not funny, but it was just like, you know, I was like, I needed a yank hour. But I, what I needed was yank hour suction. Um, and I was telling one of my colleagues, not, not in a snide way, but I was just explaining to him, and he looked at me and said, well, he's a newbie, and you asked for a yank hour, and he gave you a yank hour. So, you know, whatever, just be more explicit next time. So, you know, you know we can all learn. It's really one of the, one of the points there. Um, and then, you know, um, 
you know, help ensure that all supplies are situated appropriately, as I just said, apply cricoid pressure if, if asked to, if asked to, or prepare a smaller size ET tube, again, if it's requested. Once the patient is intubated or we think they're intubated, inflate the cuff, help confirm placement and title, give the patient a listen both over both lungs as well as the epigastric area there as well as somebody um, squeezes, appropriately squeezes the, the, the Ambu bag. Um, you know, they may be on a ventilator, but it's best to kind of hold off to put them on the ventilator once you confirm proper placement. You, once you do confirm proper placement, secure the uh, ET to manually ventilate the patient and obviously set up the ventilator and connect the patient and confirm that they're getting ventilated via the, um, the mechanical ventilator. So to this point, we've really been focusing on a lot of the general concepts for intubation. Now let's take a little bit of a, of a different turn, a related but different turn, recognizing a difficult airway. So we'll talk about a malin patty score in the next slide, okay? It's a, uh, it's a range, you're, uh, if you will, assessing the airway, ranging from a one to a four, four being the most difficult. And again, the next slide will speak to this. Reported history of a difficult intubation, um, whether it be you know, something that happened recently or you know, in the distant past, or they've, been, they've had repeated intubation. So history of multiple intubations and or tracheostomies. Um, chest x-ray examination. If, if it's a, an elective intubation and you have the luxury and the patient's not, they're not crashing, but they're, you know, they're neuromuscular. It looks like their, their bedside mechanics have been going down precipitously. Check an x-ray. See if the, if the, if the chest x-ray goes up to, to the neck. Many times they do. Um, so you have, is there a torturous trachea? I will show you a couple of images. Is there a narrowing of the airway or trachea? Ability to, uh, or, or inability. Ability or inability to adequately sedate the patient. So, so patients that have, you know, or alcohol abusers or other substance abusers, they can have a high tolerance for sedation. So they can be, they can be difficult by virtue of the fact, not their anatomy, just to get them settled down. They may require, you know, sedation, paralytics, you know, a rapid sequence intubation, upper airway trauma or surgery. We're, we're a trauma center, so we pretty much defer all of those to either the trauma surgeons or the, um, you know, the, the uh, anesthesiologists. This slide and, and associated image really shows you more on the malum patty. Again, ranges from one to four, with four being the most difficult. And you just actually have, you know, some information here about, you know, just what 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 is a what is a one versus a four. So the four is the lower right hand side. They are really, you know, talking very closely about, um, you know, large tongue. You know, maybe a large uvula. You know, just maybe the cheeks are fatter. You know, etc. Uh, versus a one, which would be the one in this image on the uh, the upper um, the upper left hand side there, where you can it's just much easier to visualize. Some anesthesiologists will just ask the patient, you know, okay, open your mouth and stick out your tongue, you know, and they'll do an, a, a pre-assessment as well. Sometimes it's not something you're not going to assess until afterwards. Um, our uh, we when we intubate, we we do a lot of things. We document it in the electronic health record. We also fill out an intubation form. Um, and part of that process is we actually have the malum patty, this Im image similar to this, and we are asking the, the therapist to evaluate, you know, the, the malum patty and, and to quantify it. In addition to malum patty score, another tool that you have in your toolbox in order to, in advance, take a look and see if the airway may be difficult would be examining available chest and neck x-rays. And these are two examples, one with the white arrow kind of on the, um, on the, the left-hand side there. It looks like there's a deviation there where the actual trachea does kind of a, you know, a dog leg right, if you will. Um, and again, it's not, not, not common, not usual, but do understand that um, there are certain uh, neck, uh, you know, neck abnormalities um, that can occur with the vertebrae, that can occur with other you know, bony structures that can result in this, um, this sort of a deviation. The uh, example on the right is actually a narrowing. It looks more like a, uh, if you will, what we call a steeple sign. Steeple sign so that, you know, where those two arrows are, it really is supposed to be as patent as it is, you know, the lower portion of that uh, film. Uh, but it's not, there's a narrowing there. And that could be due to a lot of things. It could be due in a younger patient to croup. So something that's absolutely reversible or perhaps the patient has had 
um, neck radiation that's resulted in some stenosis or scarring that has resulted in that narrowing. Nonetheless, you know, again, irrespective as to what the cause is, this may be a clue that it may be difficult to um, to actually intubate. You may be able to visualize the glottis just fine, but getting that tube to go through the glottis and dance through it adequately may be another thing altogether. So these are, might be some clues to say, I need to have my difficult airway box handy and or perhaps need to defer to um, anesthesia to get this done. So in a few portions of this presentation, we've talked about some of the individual factors that are more closely associated with a difficult airway. However, I also wanted to mention that there are some integrated scales that are out there that look at multiple factors simultaneously in order for the clinician, the anesthesiologist, the attending physician, the respiratory therapist, to in advance look at these various factors and try to assess the degree of difficulty that they may encounter in intubating the patient. So one of these scales is known as the L. Ganzori Risk Index Scale. And it was actually named after the founder of it, who was um, is a, a prominent, um, if you will, anesthesiologist in the country of Italy. And he and his colleagues took a look at these various factors that are associated with a difficult airway. They include mouth opening, thigh mental distance, Mal and Patty score, and we have talked about Mal and Patty score previously, neck movement, ability to actually extend, if you will, the jaw, body weight, and history of difficult intubation. So the, uh, this particular scale has been studied and it's been determined that it certainly like any scale, it has some limitations, but uh, in general, a few things can, can be said about it. The lower the score, the easier the anticipated intubation. And as far as cutoffs, while the, uh, the founders of this particular scale were reticent to say, you know, this is easy, this is medium, this is hard. Uh, they basically said that a higher uh, score that is somewhere north of two would tend to be associated with a more difficult airway. And as you go further north of two, go to four or five, it would be per perceived as a particularly difficult uh, potential intubation and additional adjunctive measures such as calling anesthesia um, and having uh, your, your supplies and medications available for a rapid sequence intubation available. In extreme cases, it may actually uh, in, entail um, doing the intubation either with a bronchoscope or having one nearby, immediately nearby, perhaps with the bronchoscope threaded right through the endotracheal tube. And in the most extreme cases, there may actually be a trach cut down kit to do an emergency tracheostomy in the most difficult circumstances such as those involving uh, situations where the airways may have been traumatized, a motor vehicle accident, industrial accident, uh, you know, extreme burns and fire, things along those lines. Building on the, the uh, preceding point, um, so special consideration for a difficult airway, defer to anesthesia. Consider what's called a rapid sequence intubation where you first sedate the patient, you paralyze them, and then you actually intubate them. Um, in many institutions, respiratory um, is not supposed to do a rapid sequence uh, um, intubation. Um, at our institution, you can do them as long as the attending physician or the anesthesiologist are actually there. Use a video laryngoscope, as I alluded to in earlier slides. In extreme cases where you can't intubate, can't ventilate, you may actually do a bronch assisted intubation, but you'd really need to have an index of suspicion so you had that equipment uh, handy. Alternative devices such as an, an LMA, laryngeal mask airway, or an eye gel. I'll talk more about eye gels uh, in a few slides. Specialized equipment such as bougies, uh, I mentioned earlier, smaller sized ET tubes. So you're, you're initially attempting with an 8.0, and then the, the second or third attempt would be with a, with a size smaller 7.5. Use cricoid pressure to optimize patient position. 
Cricoid pressure is actually known as the Selleck maneuver with an S, Selleck maneuver. It was originally um, done to help minimize the likelihood that the patient will um, aspirate stomach contents into their trachea. Um, and you know the, the idea there is if you're if you're manually ventilating the patient, um, some of that air is likely to go into the belly, and they're at risk for an aspiration. Sometimes you're intubating a patient who's eaten recently. So again, the Selleck maneuver or cricoid pressure may be to again protect that airway. But it was also found that it could also help position the glottis in a way that you're more likely to actually see it. So again, that's something to consider as well. If possible, leave oxygen cannula, whether it's a high flow or low flow device in place. Um, the, the more recent guidelines um, from the Society of Anesthesiologists basically says, if you can leave it in place, it's not in your way, leave it in place. It'll give you a little more time to maintain oxygenation. Uh, pending finalization, if, if you have such a, a, a you know, a, um, protocol in your hospital, whether it's actual or proposed using the difficult airway box, um, and again, to be kept in the adult units. Um, and then, you know, obviously the pediatric um, difficult airway boxes could be kept in the age specific neonate uh, uh, as well. Uh, fiber optic equipment, having it um, available as well. So if you talk to an experienced anesthesiologist or an experienced respiratory therapist or attending physician, the palm crit care attending physician, They'll say that um, probably 80, 90% of intubations are relatively unremarkable. And then there's 5% that were difficult, but manageable, maybe five, six, 7%. There's always that couple of percentage that are um, potentially um, terrifying that, that cause individuals to, to develop more gray hair. Or in my case, hair fall out of your head altogether, whatever. Uh, and then kind of the worst case scenario is you can't intubate and can't ventilate. Uh, is indeed a medical emergency. This slide is, is, is speaking to it. Uh, some of the things that you can do, you would, um, if you're the one intubating, so you're the RT intubating, you're the nurse assi assisting the intubator, um, it's, you should immediately call anesthesia. It may take them a little while to get there. You should immediately call anesthesia. Um, in the meantime, you're repositioning the head, try and cr cricoid pressure if that's not effective, getting the difficult airway box, getting it, having somebody open it up, using an, an adjunctive airway, an LMA, laryngeal mask airway, or an eye gel, the bronch assisted, and in emergency cases, an emergency cricoid thyrotomy. Um, we are actually putting a hole in the, in, in the throat. They're, they're in rare cases done in the field, and then occasionally they're actually done in acute care hospitals as well. You should not attempt to do that. It really would be a, surg a surgeon that would attempt, attempt to do that. Anesthesiologist, or at a minimum, the attending pulmonary quick care um, uh, physician. This is an example of a the outside. What a difficult airway box might look like. It looks like kind of like an orange tackle box or toolbox, whatever the case may be. Uh, but notice it's a bright color, orange or yellow, um, in order to to be easy to spot. Also located in a conspicuous location, centrally located. Let's say in the ICU in the emergency room, even in some cases in like the OR and, and other acute care environment. This is an example of what would typically be included in a difficult airway box. Obviously, this equipment could vary, but these are kind of the rudiments of what would be in there. Uh, for an adult, for an adult uh, a difficult airway box, emergency cricoid thyrotomy kit, um, eye gel, you know, again, I'll show you what an eye gel looks like. Eye gel is just a variant, if you will, of a laryngeal mask airway. Uh, McGrath uh, video laryngoscope and some disposable blades. If it's an adult, it would be a three and a four. Um, a, a, a bougie, at least one bougie, and the Ducanto rigid suction catheter. So I have a separate slide on that, but basically the Ducanto suction catheter has a different angle on it, and it's also the opening, the inside opening is much larger. So it's a better able to um, suction, um, things like vomitus, um, small particulate matter, things that a Yank Gower may not be able to, to suction out. And then you're, what you would expect to see in terms of sterile gloves, some of them will even have some other PPE such as N95s in them. Um, again, a little bit of variation, but this would be the rudiments of what you'd find. And this slide is just showing you what the emergency cricoid thyrotomy kit might actually look like, or, or known as an emergency cri kit. Um, so two of the elements that are actually there, but the one that's on the right-hand side has kind of all the, the essentials, including a bougie that you would insert through there and thread 
um, you know, a potentially an endo endotracheal tube through that in order to establish the airway. So a variant or a quote unquote improvement versus a, a standard laryngeal mask airway. So with a laryngeal mask airway, you can actually add air to that, to the, if you will, the seal, um, or it, it's sort of a cuff um, that kind of goes around, not within, but it goes around that, the, the glottis. Um, in the case of an eye gel, it's not inflatable. It is actually like a gel, a soft gel, almost like a similar gel that you might have with certain uh, higher end non-invasive ventilation masks. So it's got that, it's got, it's that gel that's kind of, well, you know, kind of doesn't need to be deflated or inflated, but just needs to be secured against that airway in order to maintain a good seal. The, the uh, video laryngoscope, I use the example of the McGrath. You know, it is what it is. There's many other, and McGraths are great, but there's many other equally as good uh, models that are out there as well. Um, so you actually see the actual scope itself on the left-hand side, and then you see the threes and the fours along with the box uh, that it comes in. We put a, a bougie in this uh, image as well, so you can kind of see in order of uh, size and order of magnitude uh, how things would, uh, would play out. So a bougie or a gum bougie um, is, uh, you know, a, about one and a half times the length of an endotracheal tube. Um, the idea is it has, it has a certain amount of rigidity. It's called the gum bougie because it's, it's rigid, but not entirely rigid. It's also flexible at the same time. The, the distal end of it is, is not quite hockey, sh uh, hockey stick shaped, uh, but it has an angle to it. The idea is, it's, you know, it would be easier to introduce through the glottis, but also so that you may be able to, to detect the cartilaginous rings where the actual angle, the tip of that is now kind of deflecting off of the cartilaginous rings, which you'll find in the trachea, but you will not find in the esophagus. Um, and again, and then once that's through the, the glottis, you then could thread the, thread the endotracheal tube through that, through the glottis in place and take the bougie out. You know, inflate the cuff, start ventilating the patient, confirm proper placement, you know, end tidal CO2, etc. I don't use them myself. And again, I'm not opposed to them. I just don't use them myself because it's almost like having to intubate twice. Um, but I, I've had them, you know, near me. I've, I've assisted others who, you know, are some of our trauma surgeons use them a, a lot. Um, so, you know, they're used to kind of worst case scenario facial trauma so that they get, maybe they get into that habit too. Finally, after my mentioning it several times in the presentation, the Ducantu, Ducantu suction catheter, not quite, quite as well known as a Yankauer, um, but it has a larger inside diameter than a standard Yankauer uh, a suction catheter to facilitate the removal of fluids, but not just fluids, more particularly solid and semi-solid material. And again, that larger lumen makes it significantly less likely to clog in an emergency situation. Also has a little bit more of a sharp angle on it, so you can actually potentially go through um, the glottis if there's some vomitus or some material there, or if the patient's been on non-invasive for a period of time and they have a lot of you know gelatinous secretions that are right around the glottis, you're better able to be able to get it out with the Ducantu than a regular yank hour suction. This slide focuses on uh, establishing and hopefully maintaining proper patient positioning in the sniffing position. On the left-hand side, you actually are you know, putting that patient in the sniffing position, um, A and B, just from two different angles. And then on the right-hand side, you're actually, you're actually showing you that lateral uh, angle, if you will, to see how well you know, putting the patient in the sniffing position um, can help align the airway opening, the mouth opening, with the, with the glottis. It's much more, so you don't have to lift as hard, um, much easier to potentially um, to, to establish, you know, um, you know visualizing the, uh, the glottis and being able to successfully intubate. The exception to the sniffing position would be if the patient has a neck injury, if the patient has a kyphotic neck, that patient who perhaps you take the pillow out from under their neck and their head stays elevated above the pillow, you need to be very careful. You don't want to dislodge perhaps, you know, uh, uh, if you will, vertebrae that have been previously fused, um, things along those lines. So it's just something to be mindful of. But again, proper positioning, pulling the patient up, putting them in that sniffing position, unless it's contraindicated, can give the intubator uh, a, a big advantage. I say that because that's really what it's about. It's about, I mentioned earlier, you know, tapering the cuff of the tube, kind of like an arrow rather than like a plunger, um, just positioning the patient, having one size 
you know, smaller tube available, having a competent assistant that's there, or you being the competent assistant to somebody else. These, these are all things, proper lighting. These are all things that can, you know, add up to, to, you know, e equating to a successful intubation um, versus one that's not, or just takes much longer than it should. Now, again, sort of back to basics here, just for any patient, whether they be a difficult intubation or not, inserting the laryngoscope, um, and again, it's inserting it in that right-hand side there, kind of, um, if you will, under the tongue, because the patient's actually, they're kind of upside down, if you will. Um, so it's over the tongue if you were looking at them regular, but because you're, you're literally at the head of the bed looking at them upside down, you're actually sliding it there, and you're, if you will, lifting and scooping the tongue to the left-hand side, doing it firmly but gently, not wedging on the teeth, not putting excessive pressure on, on the, with the gums or the tongue or anything along those lines. Um, and just, again, firmly, but at the same time, gently and uh, being very cautious not to break teeth or, you know, or injure their mucosa. This is a neat little slide. It really talks about the Selleck maneuver or cricoid pressure. A little bit can go a long way. So the top portion is showing you where you'd actually apply that pressure. Okay, and it's just beneath the Adam's apple, to, to, you know, to be quite simple about it. And then the lower portion is showing you the same airway, but one before the cricoid pressure, and then B, the one on the right-hand side after the cricoid pressure, and you're much uh, better able to visualize that glottis. We wish they were all like that, that, that the Selleck maneuver or cricoid was this transformational. In some cases it is, not always, but in some cases it is. Another case of also using another uh, another strategy that, that to yours and the patient's advantage. Critically uh, important is confirming placement. We've mentioned this several times during this presentation, but uh, if you can't tell by now, I'm a firm believer that important uh, uh, points need to be reaffirmed. So confirming placement, you know, preliminary verification, auscultation of the lungs and the abdomen or the epigastric region. You want, you know, breath sounds every time that bag is squeezed and you don't want to hear a lot of gurgling over the abdomen when they're squeezing the back. Fogging in the endotracheal tube is generally not, not a good means of verification. It's been studied. I'm not just, this is not anecdotal. There's actually a couple of published uh, papers that are out there. They talk about what are good indicators, what are not. And, it, you know, again, fogging, if you choose to use it, uh, along with a montage of other things, which include, you know, auscultation and end title, fine, but don't use it as a sole means. Confirmation, so the gold standard, again, is uh, end title CO2 with waveform, it is capnography. So waveform capnography is a bit of a redundancy because that's what capnography means. Um, color change, so if you have a, if you have a, a coloremic uh, color change indicator, um, if waveform is not available, you use the best de device that you have, and then eventually a, a chest x-ray as well. And you should also be looking at other things like, you know, your saturation, uh, looking at the patient's color. Saturation may, even with a successful intubation, may continue to drop slightly because it's a lagging indicator. It's going to take 30 seconds or a minute or sometimes longer to come back up. So if you had a visual you have positive end title, but the, the saturation continues to drop modestly briefly. Um, I, I wouldn't use that as a sole reason to, uh, to you know, deflate, extubate, et cetera. I would, um, I would just hold off, monitor the patient very carefully. If it continues to drop, then I would say that you should deflate, take, take the tube out and start ventilating and oxygenating the patient quickly. If confirmation is in serious doubt, I just gave you the example where it's in this kind of immediate, not really sure, you know, uh, that gray area. But if it's really in serious doubt, okay, deflate the cuff, extubate, and manually ven ventilate and oxygenate the patient. Um, if able to manually ven ventilate the patient, continue doing so. So if you can ventilate them, you can oxygenate them, continue doing so. If not, quickly assess and address the cause. Is more sedation needed? You need to reposition the patient. Does the patient need to be a suction with a yank hour or a decanto? Um, the, the things along those lines. Reposition the head, apply cricoid, use a smaller tube. Um, if readily available, consider fiber optic intubation. But again, that you're going to really have the, have the presence of mind in advance um, to have that stuff available. Consider another approach, so LMA and IGEL and emergency cric, as we've discussed uh, uh, elsewhere in this presentation. 
So let's take a look at some uh, some of the um, some of the take home points from this presentation. So intubation is potentially a high risk but potentially life saving procedure. Um, almost half of the med mal cases where RTs are named uh, as defendants involve intubations and airways. So I'm not trying to scare you guys away. It's it's a it's a high risk um, uh, procedure. Um, so it just needs to be done you know, carefully, you need to consider deferring to the anesthesiologist, the physicians, even a fellow RT, if you're unable to intubate. Do not let pride get in your way. Um, hope for the best. So again, 80 or more percent of the intubations are relatively straightforward for the experienced intubator, uh, but prepare for the worst. You know, have a difficult airway box or, or bag uh, available. No light limitations. Uh, like I said a little bit earlier and elsewhere in this presentation, um, know when to defer to others such as an anesthesiologists in order to, uh, to, to do the intubation. Intubation pr proficiency takes preparation. So reading, reviewing, watching videos and images. Practicing in a simulated environment. It could be a sim lab, but it can just be with a, in a mannequin's head. So you don't have to have a whole sim lab. More and more academic um, healthcare institutions have sim labs or have access to simulation labs. Okay, not all of them do, and you may not work for in an environment like that. You may work in a small inner city or, or remote hospital, but in that that case, hopefully you have access to let's say a mannequin where you can practice. You have a your your institution um, has a protocol for training and educating you guys on you know on intubation, and part of it is knowing what to see, knowing your landmarks, knowing your anatomy, watching as many videos as you can, um, preferably in the, in the context of a structured training environment. Have an experienced preceptor, whether it's a physician, an anesthesiologist physician, or a, a pulmonary critical care attending physician, or a fellow respiratory therapist, be your mentor and or preceptor in guiding the trainee with the actual with actual patients, and if need be, take over if needed. So I'm a um, I'm an intubation tr uh, trainer. There's about a dozen of us out of about 90 respiratory therapists where I work. There's about a third of us are uh, certified to intubate, and about 12 of us altogether are are uh, instructors. Um, so what we I typically do is for somebody who's in the program, who's gone through all the didactic and the mannequin training, etc., is I'll have them come to the head of the bed. We'll kind of look together. And if it looks pretty straightforward, I will guide them. I will hand the laryngoscope over to them, assuming the patient is maintaining their SATs and it's not it's not a crisis situation, and we'll kind of do it together. Or you know, I will hand everything off to them and just kind of guide them through it uh, gently. Do a few like that, and then just build up their confidence, build up their experience, and things along those lines. If it turns out it's a difficult intubation, I may just have them watch. Just come back to me. I want you to watch. I want you to watch what I do. I may want you to, to actually apply cricoid pressure, you know, suction out the patient, et cetera, et cetera. There's no substitute for experience, both as a trainee, okay, and looking at as many airways, assisting with as many intubations as possible, as well as if you're the actual intubator yourself. So here's some uh, selected references. Again, we can only cover so much in about 50 minutes uh, of this presentation. Um, the first of these is Applebaum's piece. Um, and again, uh, 2022, these actually came out in 2021, but the American Society of Anesthesiologists practice guidelines for management of a difficult airway. They include many of the things we talk about in this presentation. They include things like keeping the oxygen, the high flow or the regular nasal cannula on the patient while you're intubating, uh, just to buy yourself more time. There, you know, the use of bougies, the use of fiber optic equipment, um, and a lot of the other things that we actually talk about in this presentation. So for any of you who are really interested in drilling down more and you, don't, you have limited time to do so, that would be the piece I would access. Uh, in addition, I put the, the you know, the um, Egan's Fundamentals for any nurses that are watching this presentation. Egan's Fundamentals of Respiratory Care is pretty much the, the sentinel textbook in, uh, used by about 80 or 90 percent of the respiratory therapy education programs throughout the United States and Canada and actually elsewhere. It's translated into I have a I have a version. I'm, I'm, I'm co-author on it or co-editor, excuse me. And I have a version that's been translated into Portuguese somewhere in my office. 
Um, and then there's other, other sources that you can use as well. Um, the US National Library of Science, the Oxford Medical Education, and then Glidescope is just one of the manufacturers. They have some very good sources at their uh, website as well as some videos um, that you can watch as well. And it's, 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 it's about their equipment, but it's also about the process of intubation. So again, I wanna, uh, I, I wanna thank you very much for um, you know, joining us today for this presentation. Um, hopefully you guys got something out of it. And uh, we'd really like to see you come back to us again if you think you had a good experience here. Again, thank you very much and have a wonderful day.